Okay. Hi. Thank you for joining us in this uh, new episode of the Stack Choir Presents. And let me share my screen. don't see you guys. Go to view options, it should. Yeah. Hmm. It's just that I don't see you guys at all. I usually see everybody, but I don't see anybody right now. When you go to view options, it should, do you have view uh, video panel? No, I don't, I don't have view options at all. It says view options. It might be on the very bottom of your screen. Mine is on the very top. Not today, for some reason. Okay, sorry. All right, well, I don't see you. So it you says view options next to the black lettering on the green where it says you are view, viewing Ellie at the Salazar screen and under back right next to it it says view options with a down arrow. Up top. Mm. No, not today. I usually see you guys here, but it's okay. As long as you can see me. So if you need to tell me anything, I you need to unmute yourselves and tell me. All right. We can see you and your screen. Yay. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right. So as I said before, thank you for being here. This is another um, class uh, for the Stack Choir Presents um, series. Today we're going to continue with the Free Hispanic Music in Latin America, Part 2. My name is uh, Eliette de Salazar, and thank you for joining us. So first we're gonna, like, we're, I'm gonna spend like five, seven minutes talking about some of the things that we talked about in the last class so that everybody is uh, on the same page. So if you, anybody's interested in continuing with the uh, research um, about this topic, you would need to research in these fields. Uh, musicology, which is the scholarly analysis and research-based study of music. Archaeomusicology, which is the music manifestations of ancient cultures. Ethnomusicology, the study of the music of different cultures, especially non-Western ones. And organology, the science of musical instruments and their classification. We also talked about how diverse Latin America is. Currently, Latin America is 20 countries and one territory. Free Hispanically and in the, in the colonial um, era, Latin America was comprised by many indigenous groups, most of them, uh, mo the most important ones being the Mayas, the Aztecs, and the Inca. And we also talked about how important being a musician was. So according to Dr. Nagore Ferrer, um, she says that uh, being a musician was a prestigious and important position in society. And uh, according to Dr. Kartunen, musicians were under great pressure to follow the rules exactly. Errors in performance were scandalous and severely punished. So they had to follow a lot of rules, but unfortunately we don't have the rules, so. We also talked about um, heterof heterophony, heterophony uh, which is the texture resulting from simultaneous performances of uh, melodic variants of the same tune. And we have this in aerophones. 
So when we we heard several um, examples when they don't really sound like tune like in tune for our ears, but they were totally um, meant to be like that. And to us, it sounds different because they were actually um, trying to produce sounds with correspondence in terms of frequency rather than in terms of tones. We also talked about how the Aztecs, at least the Aztecs, um, had no a cappella music and that all music had to be accompanied by dance. In part of the uses, we talked about how they, they need to be, they, they were used in celebrations and religious rituals um, and something that it, uh, the, they called epic uh, legislative songs, which is like songs that will rule their lives uh, for war, for therapeutic uh, purposes. And we also talked about how some instruments um, accrued mana, mana because they were considered manifestations of their gods. I also t uh, told you what this, the sources I used in my research. I spent like three or four months researching on this topic because I, I found it fascinating and I also wanted to share something that you, those that do not speak Spanish, don't have much access to. So, I used uh, museum pieces. Um, I checked the uh, Museo Chileno from the um, Ch Chilean um, Museum of Pre-Columbian Art uh, and two uh, different museums from Costa Rica, the Met and the Museum of Natural History. So I live, I just went to their, whatever they have in their um, in their collections that are uh, that is available in, in the internet and I checked if they had um, instruments musical instruments I also based my research on researches uh, research studies conducted by um, museums so there is um, one of the research studies was conducted by Gonzalo Sanchez from um, Mexico. Uh, the research was conducted in the Museo Amparo. I also based my, my research on the works by um, Velázquez Cabrera. That was for the death whistle. I checked the research by Andres Servilla and Joan um, Villaperros with the study that they conducted in the uh, collection of the Banco Central de Costa Rica. Um, also the, the studies by Esteban Valdivia and Carolina Segre for the uh, Museo Pumapungo in Ecuador. Um, Jose Perez de Arce and all the other researchers that you, that you read there for the Museo Chileno and uh, for Argentina, Museo de la Plata, the research conducted by Rosie and all. All of, most of them, what they did was identified the objects that they had, they classified them and they recorded them. Some of them recorded them and some of them reconstructed the instruments. Here we have some of the studies. I also based this research in the codices, uh, specifically the Florentine Codex with all the books or most of the books, uh, the Codex Barbonicus, the Codex Laud, and the Codex Becker. We also talked about um, how we were going to study this. It was um, the classification of the instruments uh, and um, how this classification takes into consideration the way the sound is produced rather than the material. 
and uh, this classification is divided into four. The idiophones, which, is the one, the, which are the ones that we studied on, on um, part one. The aerophones, we started it in part one and we're gonna finish it today. The memberphones, and we're just gonna mention that chordophones are not present in at, uh, pre-Hispanic. So just to remember, the idiophones are produced uh, produce sounds by means of the actual body of the instrument vibrating rather than a string, membrane, or column of air. So the sound depends on the material of the instrument. It's going to have a different color if it's wood, if it's metal, if it's ceramic. Some examples are rattles, bells, mar maracas, marimbas, etc. The aerophones. The, primarily produce sounds by means of vibrating air. The instrument itself does not vibrate and there are no vibrating strings or membranes. The ample, there's an ample corpus, corpus of aerophones in Mesoamerica. And one of the researchers was saying that it's probably because wind is very important in their cosmovision. Uh, we also have member phones, which are they they produ primarily produce their sound by means of the vibration of the tightly stretched membrane, and the example is drums. Um, and the last one is the the last uh, type is the uh, chordophones, which are which pr primarily produce the sound by means of the vibration of a string or strings that are stretched between fixed points. Examples are harp and guitar. And in Mesoamerica, there's no evidence of chordophones. Although I was, um, I encountered one example that one of the researchers said that there was a possibility that, that uh, they used their, their bows but there's no really um, evidence to support it. So any questions regarding the, the introduction and all the things that we saw last uh, month? I really can't see you, so. Any questions, everybody okay? I think we're great. Okay, thank you. So now we continue with the aerophones and we're going to talk about the trumpets. I love these. These are super beautiful. This example is um, dated 300, 200 BC. It's from Peru and uh, it's made out of ceramic. And it, just, it gives a very loud note. It's a single note. Um, Remember that we talked about all the different sounds that some of the other aerophones were producing. This one is a single sound. This is this example is from the Met. Another example here we have the from the Florentine Codex. We have two examples over there. Here we have another example ex uh, again from the Florentine Codex. And I just want to mention that I love how they represent the sound. How it's coming out. I don't know if you see my, like, at the at very end of the, of the instrument, how they represent that there's sound coming. And we're going to see that when they are singing, too. We're going to see that same um, symbol. More examples of trumpets, and this one is from the Codex Borbonicus. And this one is, I don't know if I misinterpreted it. I'm, I'm still not sure if this is actually a pifano or a transverse flute. I, I think it is. Um, so this one is from Codex Loud. And we're going to hear an example of the transverse flute or pianos. Simias. 
more examples of aerophones. Um, we have some flutes, and these are from Costa Rica, and they're all dated 300 BC to 800 AD. We're going to hear the examples. Can you all hear it fine? I can hear it. People are nodding their heads. Okay. Thank you. Start this one. We're listening to the second one right now. So I don't know which one which one do you like best of these three? I like the first one better. It's very soothing. I, I don't know, but my cat liked all of them. He got very excited. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so we have now um, monophonic monophonic whistle. This one is going to be very interesting because it depends on this where the this little ball is and how big it is that's going to be that's going to that's going to tell us how the sound is going to be let's listen to the smaller one i think And here we're going to compare both, how it changes the sound. Como estamos viendo, el canal de sustracción de la bolita está mucho más cerquita. Y en este caso, el celular está mucho más separado de la bolita de canal de sustracción, por lo que va a ser un sonido diferente. So it depends on where the little ball is, and it's going to give you a different. Here we have uh, more exa uh, um, examples of whistles. These are from Costa Rica. They sounded pretty similar to me. Um, another example of an aerophone is the Daxilan's uh, whistle or clay frog. They're interesting because um, of the frequency. They have a very high frequency. Uh, unfortunately, I, do, I couldn't find an example of how it sounds. And the whistles, these whistles are not tuned to what we know as a standard pitch. Um, 
and the person that um, Velasquez Cabrera was saying that the infra infrasonic beats can produce special effects in human in humans due to the excitation of neurons in the cortex of the brain. So he's been doing a lot of research on this and how um, we react to these sounds. And uh, that's exactly why they use them as uh, in therapeutic for therapeutical purposes. Here we have a double whistle. We're going to hear an example. This is a double whistle and this is another double whistle. Vamos a corroborar que aquí el original no funciona. Vamos a corroborar que aquí el original no funciona. This is a reproduction, so it's testing the original. Y aquí vamos a, a mostrar la réplica que ya está con el sonido. Con los gatos arreglados. And that's why it, it, you can hear like like two sounds at the same time because it's, it's, it's a double whistle. Um, here we have some whistling bottles. Here we have a double chamber whistle. These are super common. You're gonna find them a lot. And they are, were originated in South America. Here we have more examples of them. They have different shapes. What's important is that it has two, two, uh, two chambers. We're going to hear an example. We can see here how they're playing it one with only with water and the other one they're blowing on it. And here, because it's with water, so they're making the sound with water. And then here they're blowing up. They're combining here um, sounds from um, America and sounds from Japan. Um, they're both these two researchers. One is uh, dedicated to the sounds of America and the other one is dedicated to the sounds of Japan and they joined and uh, made this com concert that I think that is phenomenal. 
if you want the links to the to these uh, um, videos um, you can find them in the in the handout which I made uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna send you the link more double chamber whistle bottles I wanted you to see that they have different sizes we saw the pretty small ones and now the look at this one it's pretty big oh by the way um, remember last time that we talked about those that were here we talked about um, the um, death whistle well Cuddy printed one uh, 3d printed one um, Eva sent us the 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 file to print it and it's super cool but it really it didn't work so I guess we're gonna continue exploring with that more double chamber whistles again differences that one was pretty big this one is smaller This one, and since their main purpose was to reproduce the instruments, the he was saying that it's important that you have to have exactly the same amount of num uh, the same number of holes and the same length between the spaces, so that you can reproduce the sound exactly. Because if you change either the the length of the hole or the the distance between the holes um, it changes the sound changes over here we have um, double chamber whist whistling bottles these are from Chile we have two examples mm -hmm. And we have a musician with a <coughs> pen pine, pen pine, pipe, I'm sorry, pen pipe. Another example of whistling bottles. Another musician with a pen pipe. Also from Chile. Another example of uh, a whistling bottle. I would imagine that this, the, the, the size of the hole of the mouth is going to change um, the sound. If you make it bigger, it's going to change um, based on what we just saw in the other examples. Here we have anthropomorphic uh, double whistles. And we can see here that the the body is hollow and the whistles are in the ears. This one is from uh, the Empire Museum. We're going to show you an example. Over here we have the pututu, pututu, and uh, pututu is uh, Quechua for snail. The, this one that we have here is uh, ceramic, and the one that he is going to play is pretty much a, uh, a snail. And I would assume that they will do something to it so that it makes the sound, I'm not sure.
And here we have an, another example of the Bututu. I wanted to bring this example um, because here we're going to see a summary of what we have seen so far. We're going to see uh, an, a Bututu, which is an aerophone. We're going to see rattles, which are idiophones. And we're going to see a drum, which is, which, uh, is a memberphone. And that way we can continue talking about that's that's like the introduction to the next type of instrument the member phone sound of the bututu. So as I said before, now we're going to talk about the member phones, the drums. Just to remember, uh, the prime, uh, the member phones primarily produce, primarily produce their sound by means of the vibration of a tightly stretched membrane. And as I said before, the example is mook drums. Uh, according to Cartoonen, uh, the Aztecs accompanied their sons with two kinds of drums. The Teponatli, which is a horizontal long drum with tongues cut into the wood, and the Huehuetl, an upright drum with a leather-covered head. Here we have examples of the Teponatli. So they would have a an H-shaped slit. And it was Mayoku, Mayokuan in Taino or, or a Teponatli in Aztec. And they say that it uh, has spiritual uses for um, various ceremonies. So we have here uh, an example taken from a, one of the codexes and an example of a current drum. This example was taken from the Museum of Natural History. According to Nagore Ferrer, uh, the huehuete was made from a wood, wooden body open at the bottom of, that stands on three legs cut from its base with skin stretched over the top. And it can be beaten by hand or wood um, mallet. And it was played in very specific in a very specific way. Remember that we talked about how strict um, some of the performances had to be, but the drums, with the drums, they were very specific. Um, some of the codexes, uh, they they say how they had to be played. We have an example here of our Weta. This one is taken from the Florentine Codex, book three. And again, we see how they re represent the, the singing, or yeah, it must be singing. Here we have exam uh, three examples of the Codex, from the Codex Borbonicus. We have an example here. We have an example here, 
and we have this little one here. And over here we have an actual what we went on. This one is is current. I just wanted to show you how beautiful they can be. Another example, this one taken from the Florentine Codex, book two. And this one from book nine. In these examples, we're going to see them together. We have the Wewepe here and the Ponatli on this other side. And here we have both of it again. This is from the Florentine Codex. And the other one was uh, Florentine Codex Book 4. And this one is the Florentine Codex Book And we have here instruments in the Emperor's Palace store. And this one is from book eight. Codex Becker, number one. We have here both. This one is, the, the copy is not really clear because the book is not in, in good condition. We have here the another example of both together at the same time. This one is from Florentine Codex, uh, book three. And in this example, we're going to see both drums at the same time. In this example, we see um, some um, tambores de lingüeta or reed drums. Um, it's important to mention uh, th these are from Costa Rica, and at least in Costa Rica, not a lot of objects, um, wood objects, have been preserved because the the weather is uh, very humid and it rains a lot. So, not a lot is preserved. Here we have an example of uh, another type of drum. This one is a ceramic drum from Chile. And these are from Peru. These are um, from um, this is from the Museo Chileno de Arte Precolombina, and these are from the Met. I just wanted to include this one because you can see here the it's um, a drummer. Sorry for the noise. Very quick. This one is from a gallery. So we talked about the the instruments now I just wanted to include a little bit of on um, the songs um, let me let, my, my kids are being way too rowdy so talking about songs according to Kartunen she's a retired professor of linguistics uh, at the University of uh, Texas and she made us uh, an entire study on, on, on Aztec 
songs and some of the of the conclusions is what I'm going to share here with you. Um, there are many references to ephemeral nature of the ephemeral nature of butterflies and flowers. Um, they frequently the songs frequently talk about things that things like gold and jade do not last forever. So even then they already realized how um, ephemeral love is. They also mention a lot of the color green and how that it is auspicious. They mention a lot of birds. That's exactly why we have so many instruments um, imitating the song of the the song of the, the birds. Also, some of the most of the songs are gonna say that. That are gonna talk about the singer and the singer how how they're sad and distressed, but they urge the listeners to be happy and enjoy themselves. Here we have an example. Let me go back. This one is an example of um, of a, uh, a musician playing an instrument and singing. This one is from the Florentine Codex Book 2. And this one is from the Codex, uh, Florentine Codex Book 3. We saw that example already. And over here, we have an example of, uh, of another musician. This one is from the Florentine Codex Book 2. So, she was also saying that she also said that um, there was no rhythm or uh, they they or count syllables but in its way the Aztec song is a, as strict and form in form as a sonnet the majority of songs consist of four stanzas each stanza consisting of a pair of verses we know that the verse pairs go together because each of the two elements ends with an identical coda. This is very interesting. Uh, the coda is made up of syllables that can be compared to the tralalala -la -la in English songs. Um, the syllables have no meaning of their own but serve to tell the hearer that one verse is over and another one is about to begin so pretty much like okay like this is the end of one verse now we're going to give you another verse a typical coda in Natla Nawa songs is waya waya but there are also longer um, codas as you can read those This example um, is taken from the Florentine Codex, book number two, the, the, the painting, the drawing. Over here, I just added an example of the of an hour uh, song. And again, the singer, the singer is, uh, is implying that he has gravely offended some of the his audience but he is sad and he's gonna go away perhaps to death and but in the in the remaining of his time he asks the listeners to enjoy themselves um, I'm not gonna go over the song but then you have it there if you want to read it so we already we saw the the four types of instruments and the songs so these are some of the conclusions after i finished my research music is a representation very unique to each culture and should not be seen as superior or inferior we cannot say that 
European cultures had superior um, music or inferior music because is music is just as a representation of culture and all cultures should be seen as unique and not as most more important than others um, we all I also want to emphasize that pre-hispanic music is a treasure to be explored when I started this research I I, I thought that I was going to be able to have a, a class um, of an hour and actually I ended up with two hours and I had to cut a lot of the things that I found because there's so much to explore. Um, so I, I put the challenge over there for those of you that want to continue with this research. Another thing that I that I found out was that or that I learned in this uh, research is um, the variation of instruments in Mesoamerica. For instance, there are a lot more aerophones, and still some a lot idiophones, but not as much as the aerophones and um, membraphones. A little bit less and no chordophones at all um, it's important to mention that most of the research studies that I that I consulted they put, give more emphasis on aerophones and idiophones on the contrary the codices give more emphasis on the membraphones you can see more examples of member phones in, in the codices. Also, I found a lot of research on this topic in Spanish. Um, there is, there's enough material in English too, but there's a lot more in Spanish. And we also talked about the character, characteristics of the Aztec songs. And you can find the references in the handout that I'm going to share right now. Um, and you can, if you don't uh, copy it now, I'm I'm going to copy it in, in the event as well. The link to the handout. Um, I also want to mention that the recording of the first class is you can can be found in the Outlands um, YouTube. And thanks to the Outlands for allowing us to put it in, in the Outlands YouTube. I want. To, I also want to thank um, the Honorable Lady Anne Elizabeth Molly for um, editing and reading the the presentation, as well as Lady Eva. And Lady Eva, thank you also for being my my technical assistant today. And. Thanks to my mistress, Cecilia Mowbray, uh, for editing also the, the presentations. And Lord Tenok Tenok for uh, sharing his uh, research with me. And Master Tariq for sharing his, uh, for giving me his input as an archaeologist. That's my email. If you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to help. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. From the chat, there were a couple of things people shared. Um, mm -hmm. Lady Fiora and I both think the whistling bulls are super awesome. And then Lord Tenok mentioned something about the death whistle, that it could be the embouchure, that you can, you don't need to just blow in it, that you need to do something with an embouchure as well. No, I, so I, we, we tried. We, did we you, tried something. Did you buzz and all that other stuff? So we'll, we'll play with it later. Yeah. You, you'll see it next time we see each other. And any more questions?
I, I really thought it was interesting that the Aztec songs were like the original emo. They are like overtly depressing or they're always, there's a thing in like a Nawa culture where your songs are supposed to express like grief and yearning. That's a common aspect of a lot of the poetry and prose that we have that exists where it's even when you're talking about how much you love something and praising it, it's always in the sense of um, being sad that it is temporal and that it is temporary. Everything is always about this continuation where we only have so much time in this life and we only have so much time to enjoy these fleeting things. Um, even, even the happy things sound sad. Super emo, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm thank sorry you I was so late. Much. No, it's okay. You can you can see the recording once I I put it in the in the the Outlands uh, YouTube. Anybody else has any questions? No. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming and. Um, See you next month. Thanks for teaching. Of course. <laughs> next month.